I'm absolutely delighted to in introduce Matt Elliott, who is the People Director at Virgin Money. Matt joined Virgin Money back in 2011, just before um, they took over the Northern Rock. And I think many people, perhaps in the Northeast and other parts of the country, will remember the difficulties that people went through at that time. I think with Virgin Money, they've gone on a very interesting journey and I think have produced a number of different aspects which we're going to hear about this afternoon, particularly with regard to the work that Matt and his team have done. I'm sure many of you, like we have at Durham University, have lost some of our prized staff to Virgin Money. And are we bitter? We might be. So I think it'll be interesting to see what Matt has to share with us this afternoon on his journey. So think about your questions and what we're thinking about towards the end of this. I think the journey that Virgin Money have gone on is a really interesting one. You will have read the information in the pack about what the work that they have done. But also, I think if you Google them and you look at the achievements that they've done over this period of time, it is quite significant. And I know many of us are going through those challenges now, so I think we will learn an awful lot from this. I think the success that Matt has led for him and his team have been significant. They have achieved a number of awards over the last few years, in particularly industry, business, and HR awards. They really are at the top of their game. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Matt Elliott. Thank you. Crikey, thank you for that build-up, by the way. No pressure after that. Um, so thank you for having me along, everyone. I'm delighted to be here, really am, today. Um, I know I'm in the afternoon slot. It's a bit dark in here, isn't it? Yeah, I know how this works. And also tonight, you're on the edge of that, you know, activities thing, aren't you? And I saw what was going on in all of that. So some of you are thinking about that beer tasting and those cocktails, aren't you? Um, and I'm between you and that, but I'm going to do my utmost to share with you our story of the last few years, as you've heard. And I've been, I'm going to try and do that in a way that hopefully uh, brings home, obviously, the business and the HR contribution to that, that business progress. Particularly within it, I think the thing that's run right through everything and has allowed us to achieve quite a bit in a short period of time, and that's really our ethos and what we're here to do. So I'm really hoping to kind of bring that through, and I hope that that's really useful for you. And I am going to, to work the time. There's not clocking down, that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to work the time so that we do get some time for questions, and I just think it'd be great to have a bit of a conversation with you in that period, if that's okay. So my design is to make sure we've got plenty of time to do that. If you can think along the way as to what you'd like to talk more about, that'd be fab. Um, I'm really delighted to be here in part because I just think this event is brilliant, by the way. So working in HR, but in an industry that doesn't really collaborate, and I don't know whether that's a business and academic kind of definition, um, but you know, from a business point of view, I suppose we're in competition, but I know you are too, and we don't collaborate. Now, the industry I'm in, in terms of financial services in particular, has obviously, as you well know, you know, been through a very difficult 10 years, so it may be that that's part of why we don't really join forces, but I think we're going to need two more, and I'll talk a bit about that, I just think it's great to be part of an event where that's evidently happening. And I just think that's really refreshing in of itself. So fantastic to be here and to be part of. And so for those of you that um, don't know maybe a great deal about Virgin Money, uh, we're a UK-only uh, retail bank. So that means we don't lend to businesses or do any investment bank or anything like that. Straight personal customer lending. And we have 3,000 people serving over 3 million customers, uh, just in the UK only. Um, and we've been through quite a transformation since that Northern Rock uh, acquisition that went through in 2012. Along the way, inspired by the Virgin brand. And I think that's undoubtedly been really helpful for us because it, it has us think differently and it helps us set a really high bar for what we do, quite simply because we know customers are going to have a really high expectation of us because of that brand. And of course, in the industry we've been in with a financial crisis and all the kind of issues that have followed around treating customers fairly since that point, we've been really wanting to stand out. It's classic virgin territory, really, isn't it? 
kind of an industry where customers aren't really being served in maybe the way they should be, certainly the way they deserve to be, I'd say. And so that's been inspiration for us. So has Richard. And I know this morning you had the photos up about Richard. You said, I'm not dressed in bride outfit and the like. Um, I haven't got a tie on. Richard would snip that off. So I think appropriately dressed as someone who works for a bank who you might want to lend money with. And do we have any customers of Virgin Money in quick raise of hands if we do? Fantastic. You're smiling as well. So this is good. There are quite a few. Hopefully good experiences. I'm um, No doubt you'll let me know afterwards. If not, I would want to hear about that. So to set the scene for you a little bit in terms of this period that we've been through and what's been happening for us, um, I thought the best thing to do would be to take you back to a very vivid moment for me, which was the evening of January the 2nd, 2012. And I was in a hotel in Newcastle because the morning after, we were literally going to walk in the doors at Northern Rock, having made the acquisition, and kind of ask 2,003 people to believe in us and head out on this journey together. And we played an advert um, on the Corry Break, I think it's called. So, you know, that kind of half seven slot that Corrie's on, and the break in between that is the most watch advert slot. And so we ran this advert that I'm about to play, and it really set the scene for us. And if you bear in mind that as one of our now employees in Northern Rock, you haven't even met us yet, but you know that this advert is going to play. So for us, we were sending just as much of a message to the people working in the company as we were to our customers. a long, long way over the last 40 years with a simple aim of making things better. And now our quest takes us into banking. Virgin Money, 40 years of better, now in a bank. Still love the balloon bit that bounces up on the top there. So that um, really set the scene for us. And I, even now, I take a lot of pride from watching it, because as you can see, we recognize that you don't change anything overnight. I mean, literally, in this case. Um, and so we were truthful about that. But we were also, I think, pretty clear about where we wanted to head. And in the press at the time, and in the written press, we released what we called a customer manifesto. And so we expressed very openly, very publicly, how we would be different for customers. And so we really just set our stall out. We set our stall out on day one in terms of what we wanted to be, what we wanted to be for customers. And I'm really sort of proud that we did that. And I'm about to come on to the thread that runs through these phases. But the company, I think, has been through quite distinct phases. They've demanded very different things from an HR perspective. Um, evidently, it bring the company together, integrate it, and then very much build out what we needed to do for customers. And then I think we're kind of evolving beyond that now. And I'll step through each of these and talk about business and HR challenges. I think it's fair to say that we've brought people a long way from a start point that wasn't a particularly happy one. And for those of you in the Northeast, you'll know this, but for the rest of you in Northern Rock, remember it was a run on the bank, so I've had four years post the run on the bank. And employment, had gone from six and a half thousand people 
to 2,300 the day that we picked up. It's a really tough time for a brilliant group of people because there's absolutely nothing wrong with the people in the organization. Clearly, we all know there was a business model that was fatally flawed. The people in the organization, completely fantastic, but they'd seen literally thousands of their colleagues go. And so it wasn't an easy start place for us. We were losing money, you know, and as a business, obviously not a fantastic place to be. We had, we had a long way to go. The thing that's really propelled us and driven us through all of that has been what we call everyone's better off. And I know that might sound a little bit, I don't know, trite, gimmicky, but this has been with us for 10 years, and this is what we stand by. I'm obviously going to sort of hopefully explain it for you. But if you imagine it's present in the organization day in, day out, over a decade, it must be something that's properly meaningful to you. And so I think, you know, purpose-led has become a bit of a HR buzzword and, you know, become purpose-led organizations. Whatever you want to call it, you know, I think this is what defines us. And of course, we're here to deliver results for our shareholders companies, we call it here, our owners. But we're, we're here to achieve balance throughout. And you know Richard Branson talks about, take care of your people, they will take care of customers, and business sorts itself out. This is our expression of that, and we've stuck to it. I think that's the crucial thing. It's so right for us that we've been able to stick to it. So to give you uh, an example on customers, because we knew we had 2,300 people who are going to be looking for, is this real? What's this really going to be about? Is there going to be some substance behind this? And so very early on, we looked at product design. So for those of you who are customers of us, if you have a savings product with us, what it won't do is fall off a cliff edge after a period of time in terms of the interest rate. So it's been common practice in financial services. You take out a savings product for, say, two years, with an organization at a given interest rate, let's say 2%. At the end of that time, that organization won't be very proactive with you about the fact you're coming to the end of the two-year period. In the terms and conditions, your interest rate drops to 0.1% overnight. And effectively, if you are not alert to that and move your money on quickly, within a month, they've done better out of you through that two-year relationship than you have out of them. It relies on customer inertia and I don't think that's a great way to treat customers. So one of the first things we did was change that. We don't have any cliff edge savings products. And so people were immediately thinking, okay, they are serious about this then, because actually we're less profitable as a result of doing the right thing by our customers. Um, we have something called Virgin Money Giving, if you've come across that, where we really, I think, support community in a unique way. And it's an online charitable giving site, competes with Just Giving. And you may have seen quite a bit of press recently about Just Giving from a fees perspective. We run Virgin Money Giving on a not-for-profit basis. We stand it alone, it has its own governance. We support it, but it's not for profit. So that the money that gets to charities is greater. We barely cover costs. So these are ways, I think, meaningfully, we've brought EBO to life. And then, of course, from my perspective, I need to make sure that the colleague part of this comes to life too. And we had some pretty high expectations. Yep, we'd had people who'd been through a difficult time, but still, here we were, Virgin Money, you know, bright future, a lot of belief in the brand, people liking this idea of balance and EBO, but what's it really gonna mean for me as a colleague? And I think at that point, I kind of got to realizing I need to shake off a bit of, I suppose, my career in HR today, because this did require a different way for me to think. I had been a kind of Ulrich era disciple and very much thinking about the resources bit and human resources. That's just the way that I'd experienced big corporate life. And I've been into really big corporates before arriving in a nicely formed Virgin Money with 3,000 people. And so I realized I needed to, to knock a little bit of that away and start to think about people as people again. 
And that did take a little bit of doing, and it probably took us a couple of years to get to that point. But I just realized there was no way we could expect our colleagues to provide the kind of customer interaction we were expecting if their own experience of the company didn't match up. The whole thing would be a complete fraud. And that's when it really came home to me the importance of what we were going to do in this journey. And at the very start, we were, we were tested out straight away. So when the company was integrating, of course, it needed to focus on systems coming together. The organization had to be rebranded from a regulatory point of view. So there was no question of being able to keep the Northern Rock brand. It was going to be, it was going to be Virgin Money. So things you might expect with a big corporate coming together um, I actually underestimated early on just how important the colleague bit of EBO was going to be because, of course, all our people were listening to these big things happening, seeing the product design changing and the like, but in the end, they wanted to know what it was really going to mean for them. And they knew that we were sat there with two sets of terms and conditions. So, of course, I wasn't naive to the fact that we needed to do that piece of work and get to one way of managing people in the company, one way of paying them, performance management, but terms and conditions is when obviously it becomes very real about what does it all really mean for me in the end. And I remember on the third day, we ran a, we had a sort of lunch session in the canteen. It was all very visible with a group of colleagues, cross-representation invited. It was myself and the CEO, Jane Am, and it was just to have lunch and have a chat about what was on people's minds. And it was striking how much the what are you going to do about terms and conditions? Because that's pretty challenging for you, isn't it? But I'm really interested in what you're going to do about it. And so we committed by September, and to be fair, we didn't have a plan at this point. We committed by September to let everybody know what we were going to do about it, because it really brought home how important it was to them. Were we really going to be serious about fairness for them, as well as for customers, as well as delivering returns for our owners? Thankfully, we got there. We had 99.7% of them sign up. They had a choice. There was nothing forced. And we weren't able to get there from spending money on it. We were a loss-making organization at this point. We got there because we found a way that we could explain really clearly and that we could show very transparently so everybody could properly buy in and believe in it because they knew what the whole change was. They all lost a bit and they kind of maybe gained a bit of something else. A net, it looked different, but it was probably a neutral effect. But the fact that we set it all out and they could see all of that was, I think, a point that led to a real tipping of the trust that we had in the organization with our people. And I didn't recognize it was that significant until it actually happened. But that was the point, I think, in all of the integration phase, all the business activities that we did, that we kind of won the hearts as well as the minds. And from that point, we went into a phase of building the organization. So from a customer perspective, that meant rolling out a new current account. It meant building a new credit card business. So to be honest, versus an integration phase, this was more challenging for us as a company. It was actually more complex now, a lot more going on. We were less all focused on one thing. And then from a people perspective, it led to supporting growth in the company, which has been brilliant to be part of. So from a difficult start, having steadied things, we've been able to grow, um, which has been a real pleasure to be part of. And of course, then everyone starts to get really keen about what's their career? How are you going to develop me? Where are we going to go from here? Why should I stay here for a longer term journey? And we were hiring people for really the first time too. So we kind of brought that together in the model that you can see here. I hope really straightforward and simple because, you know, it was meant to be. You arrive in the organization. We're going to make sure that you're great at your job and you're fully equipped to do it. We're going to make sure that you're managed by a brilliant manager. We are going to make sure leaders are ready to lead you. And in the end, it's all about you as a person. So all of this is predicated on the basis that your development doesn't have to be about your job. We want to support your growth full stop in this organization. We couldn't do all of that straight off. So the first thing that I learned, because we had none of it in place, by the way, is that we were going to let everyone know what it was. So when you go back to us setting out on our customer journey and we had a customer manifesto, 
We communicated it before we even started. We did the same thing here. We didn't have an approach to development in the company. There was no infrastructure kind of left post Northern Rock. And so we committed to what it was going to be before it was in place. I think that was really important. We couldn't afford to start to do it and have it in place and wait for it to be there before we told them what it was. Everybody needed to know what it was. And I think that was the right transparent thing to do. I also learned on the Virgin Money arrivals, that's a two-day event. We had lots of people joining the company. We wanted to get them off on the right start. We'd not been doing that very well. It was completely inconsistent. No way of doing it in the organization. So we had a two-day event. Anyone joining the company every week, every Monday, Tuesday, would come here to Newcastle to our offices in Gosforth with a two-day event that goes through the whole of the Virgin group, um, what we're trying to do, EBO, etc. And the reaction we had to that was completely fantastic because we were serious about bringing people on board in the right way and it set the right tone for people starting out their careers in Virgin Money. They'd just not experienced it before. We nearly didn't do it because I knew that the experience onwards from there was not going to match up. Unless, unless we had someone who had a particularly brilliant manager, we just weren't there yet. It was too early days. And what I kind of checked myself on is not working to the lowest common denominator. And I think maybe sometimes in HR we're a little bit guilty of worrying about the 5% of things that don't work quite well or that are never, frankly, going to work very well. Often 5% of people in your company, right, that just just not quite working should focus on the 95% and making that more brilliant. And this was a real point where we had that. So I wanted to set a really high bar on arrivals experience in the company and then bring everything else up to that in terms of the experience after. And we explained that at the arrivals event. Didn't make excuses for what might not work thereafter, but we did say we were a work in progress and that this was our start point. I think that was, again, the honest way to kind of interact with our people. So through that build phase, we then went into enhancing, which brings us through to today. And from an organizational perspective, the big growing up point, if you like, was listing on the London Stock Exchange. And so the IPO process in itself was a very intense one. Um, uh, and I don't know what I really learned through all that. It's just something we had to do. We did it. The important thing was coming out of it because then we had the rigors of new investors rather than just the Virgin team, multiple investors obviously reporting to the market every quarter, being really clear about our plans publicly. And frankly, it's just really good for us. It was a really good discipline. We were ready to kind of take that step and mature as an organization. And I think the same was true, therefore, for the contribution that we made in the HR team. And the focus came in far more about talent in the organization. We'd hired lots of people in to this point. So we really wanted to grow people in the company. Uh, and also, in the everyone's better off, the everyone bit, and really cracking what that meant for our colleagues. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. What you see here is where we started to reach out to our community as well through the, through the talent work we did. We've tried to make sure we've got a really inclusive approach to talent. So it's not just I don't know if you use the kind of McKinsey nine box grids and all the like, and we did used to do that, but we felt ourselves only ever focusing on the top right-hand corner, if that makes any sense. And so this model puts our core performers right at the heart of what we do, so we're having a conversation about everybody and not just a small group of people. I think that sort of inclusive approach fits with the Virgin brand. It fits with what our people expected of us in Virgin Money, and we made sure that we connected, started to reconnect in the Northeast in particular, having had a quite a difficult period where you know, the organization was a very important one in the region and naturally had kind of disconnected to a degree, tried to reconnect. So on our talent program, our um, attendees on that program would be involved in coaching the local basketball team, for example. They are now graduating and adjoining organizations like the Youth Hostel Association here as trustees and things like that. So we can stretch their development, but the win-win is there's a proper impact back into 
the community in the northeast. And so this is where we are today. We're looking to really keep it simple in terms of what we're here to do. It's about still developing our people, focusing on motivation, making sure that we've got an increasingly diverse workforce. We report this in our annual report. So we're really clear every year publicly about what we've done on it, what we're going to do on it. And I say we've become big fans of that kind of level of transparency and clarity. Because by doing it, we actually, by saying we're going to do it, we then put ourselves on the hook. We've really got to do it. And um, I should mention along the way, of course, we're in a regulated industry. And so everything that we've had to do has got to be absolutely compliant every step of the way. So particularly around remuneration, how we remunerate our colleagues. And we had a big re regime change around accountability last year called Senior Managers Regime. And I mentioned that because again, it was another kind of lesson for me um, that we've picked up along the way. As part of clarifying to people in the company what our expectations of them were from a conduct perspective, so from a behavioral perspective, the regulators as part of a new regime, they'd made a very clear statement in that regard. So we updated our code of conduct. We wanted it to come from us, of course. We were relating to the regulators approach, but we wanted it to come from us and be meant by us too. And um, my colleagues were reminding me of it just yesterday. So we had some new little glossy brochures to go out to kind of try and really present this into the organization. And it came through from the printers and one of the margins was just really slightly off on one of the tables. And we're kind of thinking, oh, it's 3,000 of these booklets, you know, there's just the margin slightly off and the launch was the next day. So it's just a question of do we let them go? or not. And on the one hand, you're kind of thinking, well, it's only internal. But on the other hand, what I've realized we've done a number of times now, we apply a customer standard. So the really easy way to think through it was, would we let that go out to customers? And of course we wouldn't. If it's not completely perfect, we're not going to let any literature go out to customers. So we didn't let this product go out to our colleagues either. And if there's something that I've learned along the way, it's to be really clear about the consistency of that standard. Again, imagine our people hearing from me that there's this new important regime and we're clear about what we expect of you. And they open the brochure and one of the lines is out of place. It just doesn't add up as being a serious thing. So we always apply customer standards to what we do with our people. I said to folks a bit on diversity and inclusion today. We try not to call it DNI in the company, just because I think it's more engaging to try and figure out in our own language what our people will understand. And of course, it's kind of straightforward for us in that it's the everyone bit and everyone's better off. So again, that connection to what we're trying to achieve as a company is really clear from an HR perspective. We aim to welcome everyone and we aim to be a place where people can be their true selves. Two simple things that I think are really measurable as well. Because if we're welcoming to all, we'll have a workforce that's representative of the area that we recruit from. So predominantly, actually, that is this region that we're in today. And we've got quite a bit of work to do in that regard. And then people being their true selves, we can measure through our annual survey. And we ask people, obviously, how engaged they are, or at least we construct that score from some questions they answer. And we can see what different groups are saying to that. And so we can identify, do we have some relative problems? And from a minority group perspective, how different to the company norm? A key focus for us has been around gender. So you might have seen some of that. Um, we were in a really fortunate position. Our CEO was asked by the government uh, a couple of years ago to do a review into women in finance. And the report that you see here is the product of that. Um, the premise for it was that financial services is the sector that has the greatest start point in terms of gender balance, that gets to one of the worst points in the senior roles in terms of a lack of gender balance. So the government were interested because from a productivity perspective, clearly that's not a great place to be. And if you can figure out how to change that, we're all going to be better off. And so a lot of research was done by our team over 3,000 data inputs about 
um, including surveys that maybe some of you were, were involved in because it was a very public process about what was holding everyone back. And we came up with a top 10 positive actions. And so this report, I think it might have been in the bio, and so it's designed to be a read that's practically helpful. And a charter came out as a result of it. And that charter recommended that companies be really clear about what they're trying to achieve, state what their targets are and publish them. If, if it's public, you're more likely to be inclined to do it. Secondly, to make sure there's a really clear executive sponsor around the issue. And third, to link what senior people get paid to the outcome, because why not? Because from an industry perspective, making those connections, why do you get paid what you get paid, against important things if it's not important. So you should surely have an impact on your remuneration as to how far you progress gender equality. So that's what's happened from an industry perspective. We've now got over half a million people in financial services covered by that charter, which I think is a great step. And we're just really proud to have been part of that. And of course, taking the challenge on ourselves, we've got a really strong board balance and ETSCO balance. And then we have the same challenge that all our pay group do, financial services. So we're really clear about that. We've got as much work to do as anyone else in terms of a, a, an equal pipeline. Um, things that have worked for us, Firstly, we took the top three from the report that was done because they felt like the right things for us to be focusing on to make progress. And that was around improving technology to enable flexible working, to create the right culture in the organization for flexible working, and to invest in supportive managers. And a, and a few pullouts on that, really important for us, is to have got our people in the company working on it, rather than just the HR team. And so the gender agenda group, as you can call it there, we're really careful to not call it, in, for us, it was important to not call it the women group. We have called it gender agenda because we do welcome both genders to, to that. And they've done things like um, invited Rod in because one of the things we're hearing was in public speaking, confidence and being able to project and the like. I know I'm supposed to be squeezing my right big toe at the moment to generate my endorphins or something like that. Um, and so they've been able to really drive activity like that. And I think when the company starts to do it for itself, it feels like you're picking up some real momentum. Something that we've been able to do, obviously, for free maternity mentoring, real concerns for um, women going on maternity leave as to what's happened to my career progress. I feel like I'm missing out. Obviously, delighted to be taking time out to start a family or continue having a family, but I'm missing out. And we're finding that mentoring through that period is making a real difference to just what that connection is like. By nature, it has to be relatively informal because, of course, there's a right time to be able to do some work, but it's working well for us. And finally, I'd pick out, we've reported on gender pay gap. We reported last April. It's not because it's a figure that we are pleased with or proud about, but to the point of just being clear about where you are at so you can just focus on doing great work to get to a better place. That's why we did it. And we've learned a lot as a result of that reporting. We're also this year, and just want to touch on ethnicity really quickly. Um, I think this is an even more challenging area for business, and I don't know how that is for you in the world that you're in. Um, I think that, uh, I don't really know at the moment why it is, but it, but it is. And I think part of it is down to obviously 14% of the population for a, for a start, but only 16% um, in management from a non-white perspective. We're just not in great shape in this country around that. And so what we're looking to do is to collaborate. I've really learned to partner with people who want to get involved and want to make a difference is the way to go. Because we, we're kind of starting from relative scratch on this. So of course we've looked really carefully about how attractive are we, particularly in the Northeast, to non-white communities. We're doing um, a program, have been in a program for three years now called Strive to Thrive. And if there's anyone from Northumbria University in, you might have been along and helped, you might have. Certainly your colleagues have. Um, we connect with local schools in the Northeast for their school leavers to come along for three days, 
And we were in a program for three days around how to get ready for post-school. So financially aware and ready, which we have some expertise in. Uh, we get Virgin Active along to help with physical well-being. Um, we do um, work readiness. What's it going to be like to join the workplace? What will you experience at work? And of course, interview skills and CV prep. So we're really doing something to just add good into our local community. And I think from a business perspective, and not just Virgin Money, but across all the organisations involved, making the right kind of connections with school leavers, that means business is doing the right thing in of itself. And then hopefully, areas like this can really start to move and thrive. Whole load of stuff going on. So my, we, we went around and spoke to loads of organisations about how do you really get it going from a diversity and inclusion perspective? And I think there's two schools of thought. One is do two things, big things, really, really well. Just do that. The other school of thought is do loads of things. I think I'm probably in the latter camp, as you can see from this slide. Um, and we plan to just keep doing lots more things. And I'll, I'll tell you why. is because I've learned that you don't know where your successes are going to come from, and they will surprise you. So the thing that has actually made the most difference for us around moving this agenda along in Virgin Money has been storytelling, and that's from our own people. And we, we came across it by complete chance. We support, supported the LGBT uh, Pride event in Newcastle. It's a three-day event over a weekend every year here. And we got involved in that event. And because we got involved in it, they gave us a package of tickets for the weekend. So we ran a competition in the company so all of this is kind of just by complete chance. And the lady who won the competition isn't LGBT, but her son, who was at that point, this is three years ago, uh, is gay. And at that time, he was 17, and he'd just come out. So for her, the really amazing thing was to be able to go home and say, one, we're going to the Pride event this weekend. Two, we've got these accessible areas tickets. But three... Everyone in my company knows that I am supporting you and I am proud of you. And that was a really big moment for, you can imagine, that lady and her son. So we asked her if she wouldn't mind writing that story up. And to my amazement in my company, people love the intranet still. They read articles on the intranet, so it's kind of not all got to be, I think, social media based. And... Um, she wrote this fantastic story, and it kind of opened the floodgates. And from there, we've had people wanting to write their story, tell their story about any number of things. You know, sometimes really kind of quite challenging things. We had one recently where uh, one of our colleagues in Norwich wanted to talk about her brother's suicide around mental health awareness. And I know it's a difficult topic, um, but these are stories that are really striking home that means something to people in the company and that we can then explain how we're providing our support to in a far more relevant way than a note out from the people director into the company. And so, so my point really is that you'd be surprised on these things. I know you're all doing great work. I've been surprised how you build momentum on them. And often, I think it's not where you expect to have made it. So the result of all of this is I draw to a close. We get ready for any questions that you have. Um, who's better off? Everyone's better off, of course. We know that by now. Um, from a customer perspective, I'm particularly proud. I don't, I don't know whether you have an equivalent measure, and I guess you do around sort of student um, engagement, um, but we call it net promoter score, so we measure customers' advocacy, not just satisfaction. We do that as well but we measure, would you advocate Virgin Money to someone else? And that measure was a negative measure and outcome, so they would not have advocated us in 2012. And that's now plus 29, which is leading from a UK retail bank perspective. We're right up there with the kind of first directs, which is something we're really proud of. We've worked really hard to do. And then from a colleague perspective, um, the engagement score, which is, I guess, you know, going to be pretty familiar with everyone, it's gone from 56% up to 81%. Been quite careful that people don't know how we construct that score. Don't want anyone 
kind of, I have seen it go wrong before in other organisations. So I think we've got a really honest outcome on it. And I also know our people tell us the good and bad because we have a very differing set of results every year. There's a lot of variation in it. So those are a couple of things that have happened. And so my finishing sort of takeaways through all that, all that story for you throughout is the core of this kind of culture and purpose. It has made what's been a really challenging period actually for us really straightforward in terms of what we did need to do in it because we've known what we're trying to achieve. We've understood the standards that we need to apply. We've known the difference that we needed to make. I think you've probably, I hope you've kind of heard these things throughout, but what it's also enabled us to do is to go about it with a real pace. Because whereas previous experiences, you have to govern a lot and do a lot of syndication to check whether you're doing the right thing, we just know we are here. And so we've often found ourselves hesitating for no good reason at all. And it's quite an intoxicating thing, actually, to just crack on and start to build momentum. And then that leads to more momentum and success. I hope that has been a useful walkthrough of our experience of the last five years for you. And I'm really keen now to see what thoughts you've got and any questions for us of the time that we have. Thank you. Well, colleagues, I hope you're as inspired as I am. That were, I found was really interesting. Thank you, Matt. We're opening the floor for questions, and we do have some roving mics, I believe. So any questions? Thank you. Hi, Matt. I'm Sandra Heidinger, Director of HR at University of Strathclyde in, in Glasgow, and I'm also the Chair of UHR. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It's, it's, it's some story. In terms of takeaways, what would you say you would do differently with the benefit of hindsight? So you're Strathclyde. Yes. Can I firstly say, I'm a product of further education. You're now judging whether that's a good or bad thing, I know. You're and a Strathclyde, I, Strathclyde. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, in the postgrad HR, which is why I'm here today, so um, thank you. Um, what, have, what have we learned? We, do you know, in all honesty, or would do differently? Um, We've learned along the way, and I kind of was trying to weave those in a little bit, because, of course, at the start of that journey, it's just complete chaos, really. Um, and you just need to throw yourself at it and, to a degree, hope that you're doing the right things. You know, I think, that's, I think that is the case. And um, you often get presentations like this where it feels like everything was cleverly thought out at the start. I hope I've not... I'm not trying to... I'm not painting that picture. I definitely haven't. Um, I think it is iterative, it should be iterative. Businesses are far too organic to set out a plan and then three years later think that the plan you set out with is the one you're going to end up with. I think you'd be missing a lot of tricks. So um, I can't, I, oh, we, we talk about this and I think there's nothing I'd go back and redo, in all honesty, and that, that's the point as to um, that purpose thing. Because I, we would not have been able to go at the pace that we did and not have to go back and fix things if we hadn't been clear what we're trying to achieve. Um, so far, no regrets. Which is a great place to be, right? Learn a lot, and I'm not saying it's all been nicely lined up along the way. I'm Jane Embley, I'm Director of HR at Northumbria University. Um, I agree with you on the uh, point about not compromising on quality, but I wonder if you can say something about the interplay between what I experience is between quality and quantity, so um, the, the challenge that we have where there's so much to do, which there clearly was in your situation, and how you continually kind of ensure that quality is achieved whilst balancing what's a very large amount of activity that needs to be completed. Uh, I do have a couple of colleagues here. I have no idea why they came along, to be honest. They hear enough of me in the rest of the time, right? We should probably ask them. I dread to think what they'd say. Um, I... Uh, it is just a judgment in the end. And I, I, I am definitely a kind of get 70, 80% right to just get it done and out there and starting to make a difference. Um, so I, I do kind of believe in just pace and energy to get things done. Because more often than not, 
you're broadly going to get them right, and it will have been a positive step. So I'm really pragmatic. I think that, only, you, you know, I kind of touched on the definitely moments where you can't compromise, though. And for us, partly they're driven by maybe regulation. Um, but mainly, it's that, it's that test of when it's a colleague product, would we be proud of it if it was for customers? Would it have met that? That's my test, really. And that doesn't have to be on, on absolutely everything, but I think you know when those moments come that that's the test you need to apply and sort of, is it, is it really there? Hi, I'm Tracy Rowe from the University of Sheffield. Um, I'm just from interested... From Sheffield? This yeah. is brilliant. <laughs> so if I had Strathclyde, I'd throw in now Sheffield. There you go. Um, interested, obviously, when you went into Northern Rock because, um, you, you know, you kind of touched on the bit about, you know, obviously, um, at representative current staff, they're feeling, you know, quite afraid, wondering what's happening. Um, and, you know, my concept of... A virgin is probably very different culture, you know, feels very positive, really vibrant. But quite often when you're in that scenario, there are unintended casualties, should I say. Um, you know, in terms of some people would embrace that change, but some people would find it really difficult. So, you know, what did you have to do really to, um, you know, to kind of engage people really early in that journey? A huge amount of communication from you know, we, we didn't have access before the 3rd of January 2012, um, but we were playing TV ads on the prime time spot the night before kind of thing. Um, and that, that, that set the tone. We had an enormous comms campaign to state what we were about. And then at least it was clear, right? So there was no space for any gap or uncertainty. And immediately people said, well, do I like that or not? And then it quickly moved to, I wonder if they're serious. Um, and then we had to see through what we were doing. And I think a lot of what helped were very symbolic things. So um, our contact center staff, so you know, telephony-based roles, never interfacing physically with customers, would all wear a tie and joke about the tie thing, but they don't need to wear a tie. We, what we said was, it's up to you. So I think there's the balance of, and I know it sounds like a really simple thing, but I do think these are the things that really matter to people, particularly in that kind of early on situation. So we're not saying don't wear a tie, we're just saying you don't need to, it's up to you. And no one does now. For a year, quite a few people still did, right? And no one does now, it's just up to them. We did things like we removed the executive offices. There were a floor of secluded offices, um, for the top ex-co members in Northern Rock, we converted them into meeting rooms in week two, open access, and sat with our teams, worked with our teams. Um, and, and, and so I think a whole collection of things, you know, there would be senior parking bays right outside the office. We got rid of those. And today, um, as well as obviously the disabled bays, uh, we've got special stalk designated bays for pregnant women. Um, and I think that those are the kinds of really, um, they're not very worky things, they're proper cultural elements. And in the end, um, I think the way that we cracked it was getting our own people telling stories about EBO. And uh, every month we run this kind of competition where colleagues nominate each other. Um, and they, they nominate each other on the basis of a great act of EBO. Um, and that's where we kind of made the transition from, I think, everyone talking about it within the organisation rather than us talking about it. Thank you. I've got someone down the front. Kate Wilson from Penner. Um, I was interested in uh, what you were saying, or touched on really, your, uh, I suppose, the, the view towards mental health within your organisation. It's obviously a growing uh, phenomenon at the moment and people are becoming much more aware. Can you elaborate a little bit more in terms of what you're actually doing? I think the first thing um, we've recognised is we weren't talking about it enough. I mean, I've definitely found that along the way. Um, to be honest, around all of, if you like, diversity and inclusion, three years ago, we just weren't clear enough about what we stood for. And I think because of the Virgin brand, maybe we were 
assuming too much that everything was okay and that everyone knew it was okay. So as soon as we started to get clearer about that, we started to get the great stories that I mentioned, and there was definitely a kind of pent-up need for people to say, well, we, don't, we can't just kind of inherently believe this is true, we do need to talk about it. And in terms of mental health, I mean, I, I'm really going to credit my CEO for, you might have seen, um, striking out in that regard and talking about her own experience, both from a postnatal depression perspective, but also um, she's been pretty clear about how difficult a lot of that has been for her and how that's left her feeling at times. Um, and she's just written a book, and in it she was clear about having suicidal thoughts, which is, you know, as a people director, not very easy for me to um, understand from my CEO. Um, the important thing in terms of mental health, I really do think, is about getting the conversation going. Because we do the Virgin, uh, the London Marathon, we sponsor the London Marathon, for the last year the charity was heads together, the charity of the marathon we always partner with and, and try and do whatever we can do. This year's the Teenage Cancer Trust, right? So last year was a really good opportunity for us to propel the conversation in our organisation, so we took that opportunity. Um, I issued a note out, try not to do that too much, to the company just this week for Mental Health Awareness Week. And the big point was just because we've done the marathon year with Heads Together, it doesn't mean to say the conversation stops here. And it's the biggest response I've ever had to a note like that. People saying how far we've come and how pleased they are that we're really clear that it wasn't a one year thing. And of course it wasn't, we used that to propel, but it just tells you how far people are watching your every move, I think, on these things. And so I think there's a lot more support we can provide our people, right? We are a work in progress on most, if not all of this. Um, but there are some good things already like mental health first aiders that we've got across the organisation. And I suppose quite a lot of the typical external support, like employee assist that the, the organisations would have. Um, the difference is that I think we've generated the conversation to say, talk about it. Um, and that's what we're going to have to maintain. And as I say, there's definitely more that we uh, need to do and should do from a support perspective too. And again, we're open about that, and we ask for people's views about what that might be. Good afternoon. Alison Ross-Green. I'm the HR Director at the University of Kent, so at the other end of the country, and equally fascinated by what you've achieved. Um, and I, I reflected on what you said about the importance of communication um, and engagement, and I suspect that was particularly true in the early days. Um, and I'd be interested if you would reflect on the degree to which HR were visible in leading that communication and engagement and the degree to which it was important or not important that, if you like, your operational senior management were seen as being um, visible and owning that engagement process. Yeah. Um, officially in the organisation, internal communications are um, owned not by me. Um, which I think is always a bit, a bit of a perennial debate, isn't it? Should internal comms be in HR or not? And um, they sit with the part of the organisation that manage events, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and I think that works well. Myself and my team have needed to kind of learn the house language, which is one of simplicity. Um, we definitely weren't ready for that five years ago. We had to knock away a lot of corporate speak um, to just get to being able to talk honestly and directly to our people. And so that's something we've really been able to learn from our comms team. I think that's worked really well. We work hand in glove on it now. Um, but your point is around sort of line-led versus centrally led. You know, honestly, in everything we've done, everything's about balance. And so I think it's got to be both and they need to be knitted together, otherwise they kind of fall and wither if they're on their own. Um, we, we have quite kind of institutionalized, actually, centralized comms. So our CEO sends a weekly note to the company every week on a Friday saying, here's what's going on. And so everyone feels connected to the wider company on an ongoing basis as a result. And if you're out in the organization, you know that there are those fixed points that you can work around. Um, and so I think it's getting to a point where you know what those central set pieces are gonna be, but for sure, the line areas have to take their own responsibility as well. 
And I think, you know, through time, we found that blend. And where we've got some areas that need to say more, for whatever reason, they do. And where, and where they don't, they don't. Can I ask you one, if you don't mind? You talked about, as part of your journey, um, changing the terms and conditions, and you took 90-odd percent of your staff onto a set of new terms and conditions, and I'm sure a number of us are looking at changing terms and conditions. But every time we turn a stone, sometimes we're finding a boulder rather than mm. a pebble. What were your boulders? Um, we were, it, it was analytically the most challenging thing I've ever done, um, because we had... If I'm honest, a whole range of terms and conditions in Northern Rock, right? Rather than one set matched with the other, we had how many Emily would we have said that we had? Yes, many different unique little arrangements going on, um, and that that's that was really the challenge was getting a, a, a grip on that and then finding a construct that could could accommodate for it. Um, I honestly think though. You need this sort of burning platform on this one. So for us, it was that the whole company was waiting for it. And I was put on the spot and I said it'll be in September. Um, and that drove the whole plan. We had discussions about whether we should uh, be driving the plan so hard through August. I was going, oh, why will not we do that? As so people go on holiday, um, which I do appreciate. And they did go on holiday, but we had to be all consuming on it. And so the plan just needed to be the plan. And then this year, holidays needed to work around it. Um, and I think we'd have really struggled if we'd have not imposed that and made it public. So it's much like you know the development plan, which we had no substance on when we launched that into the company. It didn't matter. We needed to let everyone know what was coming. They needed to know what was coming. Um, and then we were forced to see it through and actually deliver on it. In terms of conditions, it's the same thing, because otherwise, I think, you know, I get your point, you can never quite grapple it um, to the point where you can change it um, and a movable date and, and, and a public one, I think, is it what got us there. Any final questions? If not, I'm going to try, <laughs> I think on the basis of what we heard, to try and summarise some of the key themes that we've heard this afternoon. I think, first of all, Matt, I found it really fascinating listening to your journey and what you've done. And it's absolutely wonderful, I think, test to what you've done that some of your colleagues have come today as well. I think hearing about everyone's better off, and I noticed you had your five C's there that were underpinning that, but then seeing that move over the time to three key areas, which was around the colleagues' development, colleagues' commitment, and the diverse workforce. When we think about that, they're all things that we're grappling with at the moment, all things that we're required to do as HEIs and support our, our institutions on those journeys. And I think seeing your slide on diversity was superb because it's like a minefield. The things that we're having to do at the moment to support Athena Swan, to support some of the work we've got to do to get our gender balance changed the way we are, engage with the various different communities out there, and how do we do that? So I think seeing that was an absolute fantastic view that suddenly we're not on our own. The private sector, who everybody holds up on a pedestal, are actually doing the same things that we are. So I think your journey today has shared to us that we're on those same journeys. I've learned some lessons from today, and I would like everyone please to thank Matt for his time. Thank you. Thank you.